Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we take a tour of the Nunsuch Mine in the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. And then the first structure you see as you're coming down the hill is this huge rock wall. And we learn more about the Midwest crane count that happens every year in April. Plus, we have some tips to help our feathered friends who are filtering back into the UP. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Spring is finally here in the UP. That means the roads around the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park should be clear of snow by now, and hikers are gearing up to hit the trails. There are 90 miles of hiking trails in the Porkies. Some take you to beautiful overlooks of the wilderness, some to remote lakes and old growth stands, some to the rivers that cut through the 60,000 acres of forests, some to the many waterfalls, and some to the old copper mining sites. There are 45 copper mine sites scattered across the Porcupine Mountains. The most unique is the Nunsuch Mine Site, located in the southeast corner of the park, just off the South Boundary Road. There is one sign at the trailhead that tells you some of the history of Nunsuch. Once you get to the site, though, there are no signs to tell you what all the ruins are that you see. So I met up with park interpreter Katie Urban to learn more about the history of the Nunsuch and what you see today. So my name is uh, Katie Urban. I'm the interpreter here at the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. And today we're gonna to be going on the tour of the Nunsuch area. But the first thing I always wanna talk about on these tours is kind of what is the Nunsuch, right? So the word Nunsuch, what does it mean? Nothing quite such as it is kind of what it comes down to. And now we're thinking, you know, well, there's nothing quite like it, right? Well, maybe that's bad, maybe that's good. But back in the day when the title was given to it, they thought when they first discovered this mining area that this was like the granddaddy of all mines because it was going to be so great and there's nothing quite like it. So there's nothing that compared to it. But they found out quite too soon <laughs> that, well, there's nothing quite that compares to it, but it's not quite in the good way. <laughs> so we'll figure out why here in a little bit. So one of the first things you're gonna start seeing as you're coming from the parking lot, heading down towards the waterfall, you're gonna be seeing these kind of weird open pockets of spots of land. And maybe in other places that's kind of common, but here at the Porcupine Mountains, you know, we're a wilderness park, you know, we're full of thick forests and rivers and streams and mountains. And these open spots that you see here and there aren't something you, you would normally see. Start looking around for more clues and you'll notice behind the pretty trees, we have another tree that's growing. A sign from before that people used to live here, right? They brought this tree here and they planted it here. So you can have to imagine right here used to be a house. All along this nice trail we're walking on was a road. And as you come down these sites, you have to imagine people living here at one time, right? In the 1800s. Basically what we walked down here was the road with the houses on either side. We just came down here. And as we made the turn here, we're in this area here where the kind of the bigger part of the community was at. We have the schoolhouse. We have the different buildings from the different um, stores, different things like that. This community built around the mine is one of the things that make the nun such unique. It was the only copper mine in the Porkies with a village. In its heyday, over 100 people lived and worked in Nunsuch. They even had a baseball team and a weekly stagecoach ran from Ontonagon to Nunsuch.
the start of this whole area, we had a gentleman. He was walking around, and as he was walking along, he found at a base of a waterfall, which you can hear right now, all the way down the trail here, he found at the base of a waterfall a nice chunk of copper, right? He ran back to town and said, I found a spot, I've got it, and a couple of gentlemen found out that he found a good spot and traded him for his information, right? They said that was probably the only time the Nunsuch mine was actually had some form of good profit. So it was a group of gentlemen from Antonagon that said, let's band together, let's pool our money, and let's start this mine. So they came in and they put in two shafts, so two mine shafts in the area. They dug down and started pulling out all that copper ore. And they made just a very small, tiny water-powered mill. Now as you're walking through this site, you're gonna be seeing buildings and structures and rocks and all these cool ruins all throughout hidden in the woods. This is something that's taken years and years to build. So this is an effect of multiple companies. So not one company came in and built all of these things and that's what you're seeing today. We don't know exactly what was from what people, but we do know the general function of each building and each structure. The first Nunsuch Mining Company was formed in 1867. Over the span of 48 years, a total of five companies would construct and operate mills at this site. Only 20 years were operational, and copper production was limited to only 11 years. And for only a very brief period did the mine ever see a profit. Those were the years when the mine was under the supervision of Captain Thomas Hooper, a man who played a key role in developing other successful copper mines in the area. So the mines were off over to this side here, and you could hear the waterfall coming from this way, and they would pull the rocks out, and he used this whole shape of this hill and the gravity of the hill to actually move the product down towards the water. So as it would be hoisted up here, and the hoist house is above here, the rock was put in through this area off to this side of the trail, stashed here, and then pieces, would be, the rock would be processed as it moved down the hill, and then the first structure you see as you're coming down the hill is this huge rock wall. And that is our boiler house. So this is where a lot of the steam engines were at that were powering a lot of the things going around in the different spots of the mine here. So his mining setup went a little bit like this. He brought that rock, hand sorted over in the shafts, shipped it all the way up and put it on the very top of this hill here. And then once that boiler house, he had two big steam boilers in here that were running the mills over here. They had gravity stamps at this point, so they would raise them up and then they drop these giant heads down, trying to separate the copper rock from the copper pieces itself, right? So the rock and the pieces that the copper was in break it apart because they wanted that most pure copper because that's how they're going to make the most money. So you can see all along the ground here, because these machines, as they're raising up these giant pieces and dropping them, they had to bolt them to the ground. This is kind of where the milling area happened for all the companies that did milling. Let's go a little bit further down the hill and take a look here. So after the rock was crushed to pieces, the next spot would be for people to wash the rock. Kind of like the miners, right, as they sift through the rocks, kind of all the way out in the west, people were mining for gold, right, and they were sifting for gold, so they were washing the rock. That's kind of what Thomas Hooper did, but he did it on a bigger scale here. Now the next step would be using the steepest part of the hill here. He had these conveyor belts slanted down, and he would have water running down the conveyor belt, and what it would do is it would wash and pick up all the sand and the rocks and the pieces like that, and copper was heavy, right? Metals are heavy, and copper would sit on the conveyor belt and push it down, and it would result in the copper being collected and the rock and the water being washed to a different spot. And then the last thing he did is he built a tram line, and he would use that tram line, and he'd run those rail carts all the way to Union Bay, and then he would ship them out on the boats down to sometimes the Detroit area to be smelted to get the purest form of copper and make his profit. He didn't make a lot of money, but he did make money. Thank you.
What else that made the Nonsuch unique was the type of copper found here. The pure native copper wasn't in large masses like you found elsewhere in the Keweenaw. It was in the form of very thin flakes and grains that was scattered throughout the sandstone rock, which proved to be nearly impossible to extract with the stamping processes available at the time. The third company to attempt mining found a new process of extracting the copper from the ore that was invented by a man in Chicago named Jenks and built one of the most elaborate plants in the country right here. So let's go through his process because you will find some of the pieces of that process here today. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now everybody that comes down here thinks this has got to be one of the mine shafts, right? But if you peek in there, it's a huge oven. They built this, this rocks all the way around to be an oven that concentrates the heat and comes out. And they had a big drum or barrel that they had mounted out here. And they rolled the rock around in here and it was heated up in this oven. And the idea was is that the copper and the rock that was holding it heat up at different temperatures and expand at different temperatures and heating it up would break it up even more. So when it came out of this area, it can be ready for the next process, part of that process that Jenks, the chemist came up with from Chicago. So the rock was sent back up the hill and it went down into these chemical tanks and they used all these different chemicals to kind of dissolve everything. Now they called this stuff as they dissolved the nice fine copper rock powder, they called it a slime. And then directly across from that, you'll start seeing all these weird little holes in the ground. And these were called precipitating barrels. Picture these giant wooden barrels. The metal rings and the bands that used to hold the barrels together they're still here. There's the kind of pieces here and there. And what they would do is they would take that slime and they would take a piece of iron and they would drop it down there. And what would happen was, is that the iron would allow the copper to stick to it. And 100% pure copper will be stuck to that iron and they could scrape it off. And it worked great, but only in Jenks lab. <laughs> When it came out here, they spent $400,000 to build this huge area and he could never get it to work here in this spot. And it completely made this entire mine area shut down. All because that chemical process that this whole company was built around failed. In 1887, the mine was dismantled and the machinery was shipped to various other mines across the UP. In later years, two more companies tried to mine this spot and gave up. So one of the last rock structures that are left behind is gonna be something left over from the hoist house. But it did house a lot of other purposes too. This is also the same area where the blacksmiths would be set up, where the carpenters would be set up. So very cool structure. Just be careful and be aware of all the pieces that may be falling and crumbling off and be safe while you're exploring these spots. So as you come out and explore this area here, the Nunsuch area, and try and figure out little pieces of the story yourself, if you find something cool on the ground, that's awesome and we're glad you did, but don't move them, don't take them, leave them where they are. Just like this piece here being held down by the tree, this has something to do with this area. We might not know what it is yet, but this could be an important piece to the puzzle. And if we're missing pieces, it's kind of hard to see the full picture sometimes. The sounds of spring have finally arrived after a quiet and mild winter. I've heard the sweet symphony of peepers, the chatter of red-winged blackbirds, and the gobble of turkeys in the distance. Another sound that is becoming more common, announcing that spring is here, are the unmistakable trills of sandhill cranes. Around late March to early April, sandhill cranes migrate back to their breeding grounds and we start to see these long-legged birds with bright red crowns in the wetlands and farm fields of Upper Michigan. The habitat that's desirable are kind of wetland, marshy kinds of areas. They will eat the frogs or the little tubers of plants. In Wisconsin, it's become an issue that they like to eat the new seeds of the corn. 
Market hunting contributed to the bird's decline in the early 20th century. Probably a combination of reasons. The 1900s, it was down to a very low count number. A lot of hunting and trophy hunting for feathers. Hunting regulations since the 1930s and the restoration and management of wetlands helped the eastern population of sandhill cranes recover to more than 18,000 birds in the Great Lakes state in 2020. Gradually over the years, I've been coming up till since 1970, and it wasn't until the 90s that I discovered cranes. Now that doesn't mean they weren't here before, but there weren't many of them. Today, there are many that, who nest up here. Every year in mid-April, hundreds of volunteers participate in the annual Midwest Crane Count. Karen Berg is the local coordinator for Ontonagon County. It's organized through the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin. This kind of um, activity of a crane count day was basically twofold. Find out where they are and what they're doing, and what the habitat is like, but also getting people aware of them. So the observations are always only two hours, mid-April, and then that's all reported to the foundation. So this mid-April is a good time in general to see them out. They haven't got their chicks yet, and that, that's good because they're out looking and they're eating and making their nests. Otherwise, you might not see them as easily for a while. So it's always this time of year. This part of the country, as you guess, is, uh, well, transitioning at this time of year. And sometimes we sit out in a snowstorm. I probably have about 43 sites listed. And each year we probably average at 25 or 30 uh, sites that where the people have observed. Try not to have any kind of observation points too close together because you don't want to be both counting the same birds. They're loud, their voices carry. And that's what we do on the day of count. We don't have to see them. We hear them. We might see them walking. We might see them overhead flying. And all of that counts. They do have oh, really three calls. One of them is a call that's a unison call. It sounds strange to say that, but it's what the pairs call to each other. And then there's the uh, alert or alarm. And there's one that's quite soft, much more like in the nest with the young. If you'd like to learn more about the Midwest Crane Count or volunteer next year, go to savingcranes.org. All of our birds, not just cranes, are currently migrating back to the UP to breed and raise their young until it's time to head back south. I talked to Michelle Anderson of the Keweenaw Wild Bird REC about ways we can help our little feathered friends this spring. Lots of simple, simple things. If you have a window that birds hit every year, there are things you can put on that window to deter. So like decals or even like tempura paint, like in a pattern, something on the outside of the window to break it up. Because when a bird, they just don't see glass the way we do. They see the reflection of the sky and of the landscape and they just cruise right into it. Providing native plants is a really great way, even better than feeders. Because our feeders kind of, you know, if we have a cat, the cat's gonna come a lot easier. Usually feeders are close to a window. That's encouraging kind of them hitting the window. So kind of just providing, beefing up our native plants on our property, that's the best food for them. Trying to avoid pesticides when we can. That's another big one. 80% of birds, land birds, are feeding insects to their babies. So if we're treating, if we're killing the insects, then they're gonna get those insects and feed them to their babies and in turn, yeah. So it's things that we don't think about. Tree trimming. 
So we need to be really careful during breeding season. I get a few clutches of babies every year, so people like to cut down dead trees. But I encourage folks, like if it's like, you know, not if it's safe to do so, obviously, if it's against your house, you need to do it. But, you know, first really inspect and make sure. To the naked eye, it's hard. You know, birds are trying to prevent predators to come and eat their babies. So they wanna make it as inconspicuous as possible. So to the naked eye, if you're not a birder, it's hard to see when they're nesting. And also cavities. So we have a ton of um, birds here that are cavity nesters. So like bluebirds, swallows, chickadees, not hatches. So the list goes on and on. So they actually dig out cavities and live, have their nests in there. So the more of those dead trees that we're cutting down, we're taking habitat from them. So yeah, that's the big one. Um, during the breeding season I see a lot of as well. And so even if we pick one or two of those simple changes, we can do a huge um, service to them. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.